Hello, I'm Dr. Linda Wendell from Brown and Rhode Island Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. Today, I'm going to talk about extubating patients in the neurocritical care unit. I have no disclosures related to this talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about weaning patients in the neurocritical care unit from the ventilator and identifying when a patient is ready for a trial of extubation, as well as predictors for extubation success. Let's start with intubation first, though. There are five common reasons for which a patient might need to be intubated. Hypoxic respiratory failure, for example, due to pneumonia, or hypercarbic respiratory failure, for example, due to a COPD exacerbation, are common scenarios in a medical intensive care unit. In general, once the pulmonary process that led to intubation and mechanical ventilation is resolved, the patient can be extubated. However, in the NCCU, less than 10% of our patients are intubated for primary respiratory failure. Instead, over two-thirds of our patients are intubated for airway protection. When to extubate a patient who has been intubated for airway protection is not always clear. Other reasons for intubation are expected clinical deterioration and a planned surgery or procedure. For all patients who are requiring mechanical ventilation, regardless of the reason for ventilatory support, we need to be part of daily management and assessment for extubation for most patients. Patients should be assessed daily with spontaneous awakening trials, meaning that all sedation is stopped and the patient is allowed to wake up, and spontaneous breathing trials, which I will talk more about in a moment. Because of the need for frequent neuro exams, instead of daily awakening trials, many patients have sedation titrated for a RAS goal zero to negative two, or other similar sedation scores, so that they can still be assessed through their sedation. Patients who are in status epilepticus, experiencing uncontrolled intracranial hypertension, or requiring paralytics should not have spontaneous awakening trials. Hand in hand with the spontaneous awakening trial is the spontaneous breathing trial, where patients are placed on pressure support ventilation as a means of weaning. Signs that a patient may not be tolerating the spontaneous breathing trial include worsening neurologic status, increased work of breathing characterized by tachypnea or the use of accessory muscles, inadequate ventilation due to a low respiratory rate and hypercarbia, inadequate oxygenation leading to oxygen saturation less than 90% or a PaO2 less than 60, and hemodynamic instability characterized by tachycardia or hypertension. In these cases, the patient will need to be placed back on a control ventilator setting and trialed again later that day or the following day for a spontaneous breathing trial. Vent dyssynchrony is also listed as a reason a patient might fail a spontaneous breathing trial. However, agitation alone in someone who otherwise meets criteria for extubation does not exclude consideration for extubation. These scenarios are sometimes dubbed a pull and pray, since sedation is stopped and the patient extubated without a formal spontaneous breathing trial. If the patient is tolerating a spontaneous breathing trial, the ventilator should be weaned to minimal settings, which varies from institution to institution. Commonly, this means five centimeters of water of driving pressure over five centimeters of water of PEEP. Once on minimal settings, the patient is assessed for a trial of extubation. Factors that indicate possible extubation success include recovery of the underlying disease process, a positive cuff leak, a strong spontaneous cough, attempting to swallow, requiring suctioning less than every two hours, Glasgow coma score greater than eight, the ability to track with the eyes, and the ability to follow commands. However, none of these are 100% specific for successful extubation, and meeting respiratory criteria for extubation does not mean that a patient will successfully protect his or her airway. Care should be taken not to interpret the lack of these features, for example, lack of a cuff leak, as a predictor for extubation failure, as this is not the case. 
Oxidation failure rates in patients with primary brain injury range from 15 to 35 percent and range from 30 to 40 percent in patients with neuromuscular disease. It is tempting to use the ability to follow commands or a minimum Glasgow Coma Scale score to predict extubation success. However, these studies have produced varied results. One of the first studies to evaluate if comatose patients could be extubated safely was Bill Copeland's study from 2000. In this study, patients with Glasgow Coma Scale scores as low as 3 and 4 were successfully extubated. Perhaps more importantly, patients who had their extubations delayed due to low coma score alone had an increased incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia and increased length of stay in the ICU. Also, patients who were eventually extubated after delay did not all demonstrate improvement in their coma scores and had similar rates of extubation failure compared to those who were extubated once they met respiratory criteria, dispelling the theory that a delay will lead to improvement in mental status and higher rates of extubation success. Multiple other studies have followed showing conflicting results regarding a Glasgow Coma Scale score or four score as a cutoff for predicting extubation success. A recent prospective observational study of patients with brain injury demonstrated that the following are associated with extubation success. Age less than 40 years old, ability to track, ability to swallow, and a Glasgow Coma Scale score greater than 10, meaning that patients had their eyes open spontaneously and were following commands. The overall extubation success rate was 77%. Having at least three of these characteristics yielded 90% extubation success in this cohort. Patients who failed extubation were older and had higher SAPS-2 scores on admission. While both groups had a median GCS of 11 at the time of extubation, those who failed extubation did not universally have spontaneous eye opening or the ability to follow commands like those who were successfully extubated. These factors can provide some reassurance that your patient is likely to have a successful extubation attempt. However, keep in mind that over one-fifth of patients without any of these characteristics still extubated successfully, and over half of the patients with only one of these characteristics extubated successfully. The bottom line is that while we have several predictors for possible extubation success, we do not have a 100% sensitive or specific predictor for extubation failure, and the decision to extubate or not is an individualized one based on both respiratory status and neurologic recovery. If your patient cannot extubate, he or she will need to be evaluated for tracheostomy. Patients in the neurocritical care unit are more likely to undergo tracheostomy. 14 to 35 percent of patients will require the procedure compared to 7 to 13 percent of non-neurologically injured patients. However, since neurocritically ill patients generally need a tracheostomy for airway protection, they are faster to wean from the ventilator than the generally critically ill population who are more likely to have underlying lung pathology. The ideal time for a patient to undergo tracheostomy is not clear. Early tracheostomy, up to day three from intubation, in stroke patients, has not been shown to improve outcomes, but may decrease the need for sedation. Early tracheostomy should be avoided in patients with ongoing intracranial hypertension. In general, a tracheostomy should be planned once the patient fails extubation or it is clear that an extubation attempt is not reasonable, and assuming that the procedure is in line with the patient's goals of care. This concludes my webinar. I hope you found this information helpful, and good luck in the care of your patients. Thank you.